Okay, we are starting now. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. My name is Matthias Chorba. I'm here with uh, Juliet Acheng. I don't know how to spell it right, Acheng from Forest Europe. We are, will be the moderators the, during this session. So we are here to help you and guide you through this event. Uh, this will be the second episode of the, the International Day of Forest webinar series from the International Forest Students Association. So, sorry, please join us on uh, Slido. Two more steps. Uh, so later you can ask question there from the presenters. Uh, yes. So few words about this event. This event is uh, connected to the IFSA strategy, uh, which is uh, the leading uh, aim in our uh, work. Mm, IFSA's vision to create a world uh, what appreciate this forest. So uh, our working has three main goals and uh, in order to achieve that one of our sub goals is to enhance in forestry education by creating activities such as webinar series to deepen our members understanding on forestry and its importance in today's world. So uh, we can reach our sub goal today and uh, get some understanding beyond the classroom. Before we starting, uh, uh, I would like to say uh, and ask everyone to keep the house rules. Please kindly mute yourselves for the entirely of the event and uh, for the question and answer portion, please uh, send your questions to the chat box or use the raising hand fun function or uh, to ask personally. Um, if you have any problem with connection, uh, take a note to us and uh, we will help you join again. Uh, the webinar will be recorded for documentation purposes. So please, keep an appropriate behavior for the entire event. Uh, uh, and lastly, yes, if you have any technical difficulties or issues that we should address, you may message any of uh, the organizers. So the next is to introduce the speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Markus Lindner from European Forest Institute, Europe. Uh, Dr. Markus is the current head of resilience program at the European Forest Institute. Uh, Dr. Lindner studied forest science at the University of Freiburg, Germany, and obtained a PhD from the University of Potsdam. Germany with a dissertation in geoecology, the impact of climate change and managed forest in Central Europe. is ed is adjunct professor of change and the sustainability of the forest sector in Europe at the Fac Faculty of Science and Forestry University of Eastern Finland since 2008 and forest ecology system services 
and Sustainability Assessment at the Faculty of Agriculture and Forestry University of Helsinki, Finland since 2015. He started of experience in research on climate change impacts and the development of response strategies in the forest management, forest sector, sustainability assessment and biodiversity conservation in European forest. Dr. Linnar coordinates the Horizon 2020 project Resonate on Resilient Forest Value chain Chains in Europe and contributes to the Horizon 2020 Green Deal project Superb, where he leads the forest restoration demonstration in North Germany and reviews restoration processes across Europe. He recently led the supply on protection protecting old growth forests in Europe, a review of scientific evidence to inform policy implementations, and is a current member of the scientific advisory board, the forest policy of the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Dr. Linder has extensive experience of working at the science policy practice interface and was involved in several policy support studies for the European Commission. Our second speaker will be uh, Jana Leza Esteban Todd from Ricoft Asia Pacific. Uh, Jana's background is an environmental science and management. 15 years she has worked in the, with international organizations, governments, civil societies, academia, and the private sector. Her interests include mangrove system, agricultural land, and tropical forest at Rikoft. Jana acts as a partnership and uh, resource mobilization coordinator and is immersed in discussion about the landscape approach to forest management and restoration. She manages to private sector engagement due diligence processes and sits at the private sector and carbon working groups of Rikoft based in Bangkok, Anna and Mother to Maya and Xavier and spoons to Philippe. She enjoys cooking Asian food and discovering new wines and eating, eating French cheese. And our third speaker will be Daniel Sanchez. Sanchez uh, from Reforestamos, Mexico, Latin America. Daniel has 12 years of experience linking companies and financial institutions with sustainable development projects in forest. His main interest is helping in companies to design the execute initiatives in forest that have a direct return of investment aligned their environmental objectives, goals, and commitments. Daniel participates in business work to position the benefits of incorporating forests into business sustainability agendas. Currently, he leads the private sector engagement agenda in Reforestamos, Mexico. So our next step is the speaker's presentation. So I would uh, like to give the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Marcus, if uh, are you ready? Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, I think you have to unshare your presentation and I can share mine. All right. Okay, do you see the full presentation mode? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I was asked to give you a short intervention on um, uh, the European view, and I uh, titled my presentation Conflicting Policies on Carbon Sequestration. Uh, and I want to also um, talk about uh, the challenge for a forest owner to respond to conflicting policies. Um, I guess in the previous session, you may have already touched the, the um, 
atmosphere um, uh, atmosphere uh, ecosystem exchange of, of carbon. And I uh, just want to remind that um, forests are very, very important for sequestering carbon. And the European forests are currently sequestering more than 10% of EU emissions. Um, besides the forest, there's also actually a sink in uh, carbon in the harvested wood products of about 1% of the EU emissions. And uh, in addition, um, the bioenergy use uh, from biomass is um, um, supplying about 7% of the EU energy needs at the moment. In addition, we also have some role of the forest um, and the forest um, sector in actually substituting um, fossil um, fuel emissions. This graph illustrates that we have two different levers, the sequestration lever, which is including the carbon sequestration in the forest ecosystems on the left. And then in the center, you see the carbon sequestration options in the wood products and harvest residues. And on the right, you see uh, the substitution lever, which is the possible um, use of wood products to substitute uh, other materials, which are then linked with fossil fuels and, and non-wood uh, products there. The important message is that you can't maximize both at the same time. If you maximize the carbon sequestration in the forest on the left, uh, this means stopping management, not cutting wood anymore. This means there is no carbon sequestered in those products and you cannot do any substitution. On the other hand, if you maximize uh, product use and substitution on the right, you will actually decrease the um, sequestration of carbon uh, in the forest ecosystem because you are removing the trees to actually um, uh, use them for, for the products. So it's a very clear um, a choice you have to take um, how you want to influence the carbon balance and how to use the forest and the, the, the um, uh, wood sector uh, in your climate change mitigation strategies. So there is different ways uh, to increase the forest um, climate change mitigation. One is to increase uh, protection of forests, which is um, uh, the, the approach to actually uh, enhance the, the, the carbon in the forest ecosystem. And um, this is an ongoing process. In Europe, uh, we, we see a, a continuous increase of protected areas since the year 2000. Um, and in Germany, for example, uh, there is a discussion that we could increase the current protection uh, level of about, around 3% to 5%, which is the current national target or even 10%, which is the European target. Um, <clears throat> this is usually the, the best way to have short-term um, impacts if you would uh, stop managing forests, but um, uh, it's a question how sustainable this, this uh, effect will be, because when you stop managing forests, the growth rates will be decreasing at some point, and you might have also uh, new disturbances, which may then actually jeopardize your carbon sequestration in the forest. Uh, another way of increasing forest carbon sinks is actually to um, not protect them, but actually to manage them a bit more actively by using, um, for example, um, very productive uh, seed sources. Um, and there are some estimates that um, using improved genetic uh, material might actually enable to um, get about 10 to 25 percent additional forest productivity. But um, this um, is, of course, not the interest of the EU policy, which at the moment is very strongly advocating the set aside of, of forest area and um, focuses on this protection pathway uh, with a EU policy aimed to actually achieve 30% of protected European land area. Um, and one of one third of those protected areas, 10% uh, should actually be strictly protected without any management. And all the remaining primary and all cross forest uh, should also be included in this 10% of strict protection. Uh, in contrast to that, we have very different policy targets. For example, the bioeconomy um, directive, which um, sees a huge potential that we can actually have in our construction sector to utilize more wood 
In this image, you see two examples. On the left, you see a typical um, house construction in, in Finland uh, of a, a family home. Uh, on the right, you see actually the headquarter of the European Forest Institute, which is hosted in the um, Forest Research uh, Office of uh, METLA, uh, nowadays Luke in, in Finland, uh, which was the largest wooden office building when it was opened uh, some uh, 15 years ago. But this um, pathway of uh, utilizing more wood in construction uh, actually is depending on um, utilization of, of wood. And um, if you um, protect more forests and have less wood available, this kind of policy target is very difficult to achieve. So you really have conflicting policy targets. On the one side, intensive forestry to support a renewable bioeconomy. On the other side, reduced management intensity with more biodiversity protection. So the question is more or less forest resource utilization. And um, these go along with very different strategies to support climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. I'm showing here uh, just this uh, conflicting view also reflected by the society. So on the forest sector view, you would actually uh, advocate continuous production and use of the wood from the forest to maximize carbon sequestration in the combination of forest ecosystems and the wood product uh, use and the maximization of substitution effects versus on the other side, you have the nature conservation view um, to rather accumulate carbon in old forest stands and to store carbon in the ecosystems. But now let's look at a, a recent example. We have large scale bark beetle outbreaks here currently in Central Europe. Um, we have about 450,000 hectares, uh, which are affected in Germany alone. And now imagine you would be a, a forest owner um, who's managing this kind of forest area. So what, what should you do actually? Uh, spruce timber was the main economic basis of forestry in the region before, and the forest owner was very much depending on selling wood um, to, to get an income from, from this uh, wood uh, use. But suddenly with the bark beetle infestation, there were huge amounts of uh, savage uh, timber flooding the wood markets. The, the market price has collapsed and suddenly the owners had no chance to actually get income from, from all this wood anymore. Uh, and they are now uh, facing a situation that in the next 30 years, they will probably have no income from any harvesting because all the major stands are now uh, dis uh, destroyed by the bark beetles. Uh, so now uh, one pathway would be to actually reforest the stands with climate adapted species. Uh, and there are some sub state subsidies for this, but uh, this will uh, require quite some uh, active investments uh, and also a lot of uh, continuous management afterwards. Uh, but on the other side, um, because of the new uh, targets on increasing biodiversity protection, there's also new incentives to um, actually support owners who are willing to set aside their, their forest for management, uh, which could also be a pathway now to um, uh, not reforest, but rather wait and, and uh, let the natural ecosystem dynamics evolve in, in their forest. So we are facing um, really big uh, decisions. Uh, the owners, also the policy, is somehow not very clear because we have very conflicting targets and uh, there is uh, no easy um, solution. Uh, I think that trade-offs in the management objectives and the policy targets are inevitable because you can't do both, manage more and manage less at the same uh, site. Uh, you can um, try to integrate these things in a, in a landscape setting, but that's the next point I will make. Um, I just wanted to stress the, the point that um, if we do not drastically reduce our wood consumption, I think maximizing forest protection is not a solution because you then only uh, kind of uh, shift the, the demand for, for, for timber from local sources to imports from other world regions, which may, then may actually have the, the same problems with uh, uh, maybe um, uh, cutting down the natural resources and, and uh, maybe even uh, unintended uh, deforestation elsewhere. Um, so there's no one fits all strategy, a combination of different alternative management need, uh, strategies is needed. 
And um, this may then include some more strict protection, some climate smart forest management, but also the integration of biodiversity protection in productive forests. So uh, what we need is, um, uh, I think, uh, a diversity of, of uh, strategies at different levels. And one such uh, uh, proposal is the triad management, which combines protected areas, intensive plantation management, and multifunctional integrated forest management uh, in different parts of the landscape. And uh, that's all from my side for this uh, quick uh, uh, intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I think we have some interesting questions after the speaking sessions. Uh, I hope everyone learned a lot from this and uh, get uh, some knowledge from it. So now I would like to give the floor to our second speaker, uh, Jana, if it's right for you to share your screen. Can you see my screen at the moment? Yes. Okay, let me just, oh, hang on. Here we go. Okay. Ah, all right. So good, uh, Good morning, good afternoon, good sorry, evening Jana. to all. Uh, sorry oh, for interrupting. We can see it in the... For sponsoring this second episode. Um, local carbon policies as a pillar for global policy implementation. It's very interesting, and I'm really glad that Dr. Marcos was the first one who spoke because it gave us an overview of what carbon is really in the context of forest management. Because for tonight, I will address two objectives that the IFSA team asked me to speak on. Number one, what is the local carbon policy in the Asia-Pacific region? And what is the perspective of RECOFT in context of its work? Now, that's a very good conversation. But since I only have 10 minutes for you, I'm going to give you an overview of what RECOFT is and try to situate local carbon policies in the context of our work. Let's begin. So who is Recoft? Recoft actually believes in a future where people live equitably and sustainably in and beside healthy forests. We were founded at least 36 years ago. Actually, it will be our founding anniversary on March 27. And we take a long-term landscape-based approach, an inclusive approach to helping local communities secure land and resource rights, primarily to stop deforestation and build alternative livelihoods, achieve gender equality, all in the context of combating climate change. We are located in seven countries over the Mekong region, Nepal, and Indonesia. But we have presence in the Philippines, in Papua, and also around the Pacific. So we have partners in China as well as in Korea. We are very proud of our influence and partnerships, especially with the ASEAN region and also the European Union. And this spreads far and wide to multilateral institutions, governments, and local communities. IFSA is one of our very dear project and network partners. We've been collaborating with IFSA for the International Day of Forests since we became MOU partners in 2019. In fact, in Thailand, IFSA helped us establish the first local committee housed in Kasetsart University, all in the name of Sustainable Development for Forestry. Rikov is also a proud member to IUCN, the People's Forest Partnership, and the Rights and Resources Initiative. We are also part of the FSC. So we are very, very aware of global movements that are involved in conservation, nature-based solutions, 
and human rights. That's because we help countries and communities to achieve sustainable development goals for poverty, hunger, environment, climate change, and gender. And on all of this, our entry point is community forestry. We have four pillars or four goals that we address. It's landscapes in a changing climate, social inclusion, gender equity, and public action, private sector engagement in enterprising communities, and governance and conflict transformation, which is very relevant for our conversation tonight. In the recent year, especially uh, between 2018 to 2023, RECOF has been very active in bridging the gap between forest governance and people. This is because of our prioritizing civil society for forest law and governance in the Mekong region. And I invite you to look at our website for that. But more importantly, we were at the right place at the right time in this period. Why? This was the time of momentum building for indigenous peoples and local communities in global conversations such as the UNFCC COP26. In 2021, at the Glasgow Conference, there was a landmark agreement by private sector and other partners to actually contribute or commit $1.7 billion over five years to support and defend indigenous peoples and local communities' rights to land and forests. Why is this important for RICOF? Because it allowed us to be part of a partnership that really made IPLCs at the forefront of climate and carbon market finance. And I would like to offer that for tonight. When we talk about carbon policies, this always involves carbon financing. And that's why we became part of the partnership because we wanted to make sure that capital and finance flow directly into local communities and indigenous peoples that are part of our mission and vision. More importantly, last year, people and biodiversity were at the heart of biodiversity conversations because more, more and more people are realizing that biodiversity is not just an after effect of climate change resilience activities. It is at the heart of it. So there were a lot of talk, but more, more relevant to our work is that IPLCs and local communities are now part of the conversation. In fact, um, our work that we've been doing since uh, 10 years ago has now been recognized at the ASEAN region. So we have established guiding principles on social uh, forestry. And in our seven countries, we're very happy that the ministers of the ASEAN adopted this for their ministries of environment. We also launched a training manual for certification of forest management and legal trade of forest products. And this is very relevant because of the EU policy on deforestation. There's a lot of new things uh, that local communities need to be aware of so that when the global policies reach national level, they would not be shorthanded. So what are we doing to support local and regional policies? We do what we do best. Our strength is really in capacity building. And since the pandemic, we have turned to online and digital means to reach our public and to reach our people more. So we've been asked, like, how does RECOF do carbon measurement or monitoring? We actually develop digital courses that would help practitioners and students like you to learn about carbon measurement and land use planning. Uh, there are a lot on our website. Right now, we are having our Community Forestry 101 e-course, and all of this supports that. So as a parting shot, I think when we talk about regional policy and global policies on carbon as a pillar for implementation, let's keep in mind that governance is really at the heart of everything. And we don't need to be lawyers. We don't need to be experts in carbon dioxide or carbon pricing. But what we need to remember is that in every region, there are contexts. And 
we have to be um, sensitive to all of these multiple layers of issues. So that's why at Recoft, we believe in working with partners and looking at the heart of the solution, which is really people and communities at heart. So that's it for me. I hope that I helped and looking forward to communicating with you. Please visit our website and thank you very much. Thank you, Jana. That was a quite, quite informing speech and thank you for presenting us. I think it will help everyone to better understand the situation of the local communities. And uh, I'm sure we have uh, several questions in this interesting topic. Uh, so now I will ask our next speaker to the floor. Uh, Daniel San Sanchez. Thank you, Matthias. Can I share my screen now? Yes. OK. Let me know when you can see it in full screen. Not yet full screen. Not yet. Is it better now? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, very nice to be with you here in Mexico. It's Barely, it's early in the morning. It's like between nine and 10 in, in the morning for me. So I am like in a better position of energy than Marcus and Jenna. So thank you very much for opening the space and introducing these, these topics to the audience. And very, very happy to be here with, with the students from IPSA um, and talk about our experience talking, uh, working on these issues. Actually, uh, as Jenna said, I think that the, the, the way that the conversation has, has been de delivered today is being like very curated because Dr. Matthews talk, talked to us about the, the you know the, the, all the potential for, of, of forest ecosystems to be like carbon sinks, uh, natural and, and all the management that it's that is being in trouble about how to choose if we go to the conservancy um, uh, strategy or the management strategy, and then Jenna talking about the governance and and just uh, recognizes that uh, that there are a lot of people that depends on this forest to for their for their lives. So I think uh, my information is going to be you know like just adding to the to that to the information. So just uh, a couple of slides talk uh, more about Reforestamos. So Reforestamos is a Mexican NGO. Um, we have uh, been working. Uh, for 20 years uh, in the region. We only have operations in Mexico, but we are very, very interested in the Latin American region, you know, going to the south from Mexico. So uh, what, we, what we envision, or our mission is just to, to foster sustainable management of forest through thriving forest. And, and, and our vision is that forest can be the best ally, allies for achieving the SDGs or all the, all the problems that we have it doesn't, uh, if it comes from the, the health sector or the economy sector, environmental sector. So we think forests are more than environment. They are, they, are, they, they can go further and we can just uh, add forests to the solution making of, for the SDG agenda. And we are basically working in, in, in four main objectives. We are aiming to stop deforestation in our country and in the region. We want to increase the sustainable, sustainable forest manage, management. We are also part of FFC, as, as Jenna told us, with, with RICO. Uh, we, we promote the use of FFC standards uh, with local communities and to connect, to it, to connect them with the, with the market. Uh, and we also promote the forest landscape restoration. So we do a lot of reforestation programs, but with a landscape uh, vision. And, and in recent years, we have incorporated the, the urban the urban agenda. So we are we that's where most of the people live in, in in cities. So we want to connect people in the cities with forest through the increasing of urban tree canopy. So those those are like our main pillars. And we are not very focused on carbon. You know, to be true, uh, we used to have like a carbon agenda, a climate change area, like 13 years ago. When I when I started working in Reforestamos, 
But at that time, you know, the, the, the things were very, very different from now. So uh, we weren't, you know, like moving the needle in the, in, in, in the carbon agenda. Uh, we didn't have enough, enough um, regulation back on those, on those days or even markets that recognize the, the carbon. So there were so many little projects on the, on the ground. So we kind of step aside, outside, uh, step aside of the carbon agenda for many years. And then we, we came back a couple of years ago because everything has, has been changing. And we, uh, we work with a lot of companies every year. We are very close to the, to the private sector. And this is an, a topic that has been raising uh, their interest in the last year. So they want to invest uh, in forest to, to get the carbon, the carbon that is being sequestrated to, to meet their own, their own uh, objectives. Um, so we, we, we kind of have to, to, to come back to the, to the carbon agenda. And this is what, what we have been learning, what I am, I'm going to share with you. So just uh, a regional context about climate change in Latin America. So uh, as a region, we are, we are only uh, adding um, about or around 5% of the global uh, emissions to the atmosphere. So we are not very intensive in carbon, in carbon uh, you know, like producing carbon to the, to the atmosphere, but we are also a, a, a regional that is very vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable to, the, to the effects of climate change. So, um, so we, are, we, we see it like, like Marcus told this in, the, uh, in, in some of, of, of his slides, he showed a, 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 a picture of a, of a forest that had this beetle Beetle bark trouble. We have a lot of those of, of those uh, um, healthy issues in the uh, in our forest because of climate change. A lot of a lot of fires with, with, with wildfire fires, and a lot of migration also because of that to 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 the United States or other other sectors. So uh, we are very vulnerable uh, regarding climate change in the region, but. I only can talk to you about the Mexican context when we are talking about carbon policies. We, I, I, we haven't done a, um, a proper research on the re, on the regional policies, so I just want I just want to talk to you about about the Mexican context. So um, we have we have a, a, a good carbon policies in Mexico. So uh, from my understanding, I know that Mexico was the first country in the world that had that that has. Um, um, a, a, a general law on climate change. So uh, uh, it was, it, this law was put together back in, 20, in 2012. Uh, and, 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 and that just created a lot of things because uh, as you may know, uh, when you have a general law in, 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 in a country, then some instruments can be, you know, being um, um, uh, put together to, just, just to materialize that that law. So some instruments in Mexico that we have related to climate change is this climate change special program. We have a national climate change strategy, and we ha we have some subnational climate change programs. But they are all you know based based on the how how do they uh, need to put some some state subsidies on the on the subject or what kind of activities they they should be prom promoting. But I I. I uh, personally, like more the, the economic and the market mechanisms. So, um, two related to the subject is the the emission trading system. Uh, that this this is a, a very common mechanism in the world. Uh, and as Jenna said, in, in COP twenty six and after Paris Agreement in in, in twenty fifteen, this kind of instruments has been more uh, you know notorious in the in, in in the agenda and the voluntary market you know the, there there has been the evolution of a of a voluntary market that is aiming of tra uh, to 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 trade carbon carbon credit sequestrations or, or credit carbon compensations that can be sold in this voluntary market around the around the world and it has its own rules and i just you know mark that voluntary market because that's going to be the the, the economic mechanisms that I want to talk to you about more about what he, we have been seeing and learning in, in Mexico and, the, and in some in some other countries in the region. So uh, what kind of stakeholders are involved with these kind of mechanisms in the voluntary market? Uh, all of the all of the stakeholders are, are just you know working to, to neutralize or compensate compensate their emissions. 
Uh, and there's a lot of stakeholders. You know, the, uh, in uh, 20, 10 years ago, there were so many, so so little stakeholders that you can, you know, count them with your with your with your hands. But nowadays, there are tons of, of stakeholders that they are work. They are they're doing a lot of things to to participate in the voluntary market. And this voluntary market was uh, the connection with the with the international policies that in the international level we had this Paris Agreement that just that just boosted the agenda. Because of that, then a, com a lot of uh, um, countries had to, to to start doing their national determined contributions for for meeting the the, clim the, the climate agenda in, in an international way. You know, so the governments had, are part of that kind of agenda. And then we we have a lot of companies setting net zero goals for being net zero carbon neutral to 2030 or to 2050. So that means that they have to reduce their emissions within their operations. And when in the cases where they can meet their own objectives, they have to, to go buy the, the, the carbon that is being sequestrated by other projects like in the forestry sector. But there are other sectors that, that are already uh, sequestering carbon as in the energy in the energy sector, in the, uh, in the, in the garbage sector, or is, is that the sector? I don't know if that, the, is that that's the sector, the garbage, but the, you know, the all the, the, the garbage projects that are sequestrating, sequestrating carbon. So th this has set like the table to, to talk about carbon in, in, in forests. And um, I wanted to show you this kind of, what kind of factors are related to a market, to a voluntary market that are sequestrating, sequestrating carbon in, 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 in forest. So we basically start with the communities, with local communities that are the forest owners. In Mexico, uh, we, we have a, a social tenure of forests. So about 60% of the forests are, are, are owned by local communities. And, and all of them have to have a good governance to, to, to make decisions of what to do with their, with their forest. So they are the main actor in the, in, in the voluntary market. Uh, and then we have the technicians, you know, and, and there may be some maybe of your interest because a lot of forest engineers are working or are, are establishing these small and medium enterprises and they are getting to know the techniques and the standards that they have to be that, that, that needs to be applied in the forest to, 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 to quantify the, the carbon that is being sequestrated. And then we have the, the standards, the international standards. Here in Mexico and in, and in the North American region, these are the, the most common standards that are setting the rules or the or the, the uh, how how a, a carbon sequestration project has to be de delivered on in a forest. So we have this berra at, at the top of the of, of this um, um, this image. Uh, it's like the it's the most uh, commonly known standard in the world also here in, the, in, in, in North America. And when we have, we have this climate actual reserve a standard that has, it, it had, uh, it's been produced, I think, in California, they, they make this, this, this uh, in the US, they made, they made this standard. And this plan Vivo that is very local uh, and it's, it has some so little projects, but we have all the other, other um, kind of standards in the region. Uh, in Mexico, we don't have national standards, but in, in uh, countries like, like Colombia, they have a lot of standards. They have been producing local standards that meets local local needs. And as Jenna told us, uh, meeting the local the local context that they are facing, not only in the in the ecosystem or in the natural way, but also in the social way. That is very important. Um, and then we have the government that set, that, that sets the rules. You know, all the all the laws, all the all the subsidies. And just just set the table for so, so everybody can play a role in the in the market. Um, then we have this, the investors. There are a lot of investors that are that are seeing like a very good um, business opportunity in, in this kind of projects because uh, you know now the price of carbon has been very very high, and they they see that it's a very good business opportunity to invest their money in these kind of projects or companies that are uh, doing these kind of projects on the ground. Then we have the buyers. Mostly there, these are like uh, large companies or individuals that can, you know, that needs to be like carbon neutral and they are uh, aiming to, to, to buy these, these carbon credits that are being, you know, done in a responsible way in, in, in environmental or, so, or social way. And then there's, there are brokers, yeah? there are people that are just, just buying and selling in, uh, and, and, and getting an, um, you know, a, a, 
uh, a revenue because of that. So there's a lot of, of stakeholders, and everybody has, you know, needs an in, has a, an special interest, and they need and they are seeking for something to clad to uh, um, uh, for climate change uh, and for the economy, and you know, to make a living out of it. So and, and then we have some this interesting at the I put it up at the last of this of this uh, chart because. Uh, there have been uh, these kind of uh, structures that are aligning the, all these all these um, stakeholders, and there are in, in the region we have a, a very interesting case in Colombia, which is the Asocarbono in the the lower part of the of the image. Uh, Asocarbono, they are inviting all the stakeholders and it's you know like uh, setting the, the 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 conversation and the, and and promoting good communication among each other. Uh, and they have um, an advocate, an advocacy program just to to talk to the government, so the government can you know have better laws. So that's the way that uh, the, the 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 international policy is just impacting the regional and local policies. Uh, and the implementation on, uh, of the policy in Mexico, uh, you know, because this is a very very interesting and new kind of market for for the Mexican context. Government is very, very worried about how it's being developed, and uh, currently they are they are making like a um, a, a specific regulation for forestry projects that are uh, looking for carbon sequestration, and their main concerns are uh, that they need to have a, like a national registry of, of of projects. So there are a lot of projects that have been done in the country, but nobody knows them where they are, what are, what are the the communities that. Are, that are living in those kind of projects. What are the the standards that are being used? So there is no transparency in the information. So government wants to to put that on the in the market so everybody uh, is being seen about what they are doing. Um, another thing is the use of international standards. So there are many standards in the world, and and some of them are better for the local context, and some of them are not. So the, the 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 local policy wants to be you know they want to regulate more the use of these international standards in the in 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 the in the nation or in in our country, and then also the commercialization practices. So they want to avoid double counting. So a project being sequestrating carbon, they can sell it two times to to different stakeholders. So it's a it's a very very main concern for the international policy as well about avoid, avoiding the double counting of, of carbon sequestration in these kind of projects. And, and a good commercial, maybe this is the, the, the most important concern of the, of the, uh, the government, but also of, of other stakeholders. Uh, you know, like uh, this is, these are kind of new projects for local communities, and it's a very, very complex um, um, uh, models and, and very complex market. Uh, and uh, and the concepts are very com complex. So a local community that is that is not connected to to the international level and to the, all all those those big new markets, they can be you know like easily lost in the conversations, and and the commercial negotiations can be uh, in a bad way for them. So uh, we have heard about some bad practices uh, that that communities are not being paid enough. For the for for the, the the carbon that is being sequestrated sequestrated in their in their lands. Um, so the main conclusions of of these slides for me it's just three. So it's uh, I would say uh, the biggest challenge for a good regulation at a local level, responding to the international level, it's a good communication among all the state stakeholders. As you as you saw, there's a lot of of stakeholders that are participating in, in, in this kind of policies. And everybody has their own interest and their own kind of view uh, uh, or their own um, interpretation of, 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 of things. So it's very, very crucial to have a good, a good uh, communication among everybody. And using in the, uh, if, it, if we can, the institutional spaces for that. So uh, the conclusions of, the, of those communications, communications can be recognized by, by the governments and 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 it can just take those conversations to the to the national policy. So the second the conclusion would be the international policy need to achieve different regional and local contexts. Again, as Jenna said, we need uh, we need uh, the international policy uh, recognizing that 
people in Asia is different from people in, in Latin America than people in Europe and people in Africa. And in, inside of those continents, there are very, very different histories of people living in, 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 in forests. So it has to be, you know, like a has, has to be a, uh, it, it needs to be to, to have a, like a wide approach, the international policy to meet all these uh, demands. And, and the last conclusion would be uh, that for efficient implementation of the policy, it's necessary that it responds to the speed of the market and its innovations. It, talking about uh, carbon credit compensation, you know, like these markets that are that are selling and buying carbon credits uh, that are being produced in, in forests, the market is going very very fast, and the innovations also is going are going very very fast. The regulate that I mean the all the stakeholders that are not not part of the public of the public sector, they are very, very, you know, uh, very fast in, in, in the way that they are working. And then we see we see the, the, the public, the public sector and the policy like very, very slow, you know, they, they are, they, they are, they start to make a regulation. And then when it's all done, everything has changed in the market. I mean, the I mean, the local context. So it has to be to, to has uh, that that fast in the in the evolution of the of the policy. So that's that's all for me. Uh, this is my my email. Uh, you can uh, write me in at the right email if you want to be in contact with us. And thank you very much. And very keen to see you to to hear to listen that your your questions. Thank you, Danielle. Your presentation presentation uh, was it gives us a, a new cite a few to the carbon market and the carbon policies. And uh, thank you for being here. And now I would like to give the floor to Juliet, our co-host. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, my co-host, for giving me the floor now. I'm actually very happy about this webinar. I've really learned a lot. So uh, thank you to all the speakers, for your wonderful messages. It was surprising for me to see that all the speakers were actually in agreement that local contexts do matter. So when we talk about you know, regional policies and how they affect or how they impact the global ones or how they impact, so the issue of uh, local context came up from, by, like, from all your presentations. So this was uh, really amazing. So for those who are wondering who I am, I am Julieta Chen and uh, I am from the Forest Europe process. So Forest Europe is the ministerial conference on the protection of forests in Europe. And uh, our role is to develop common strategies for our 46 signatories on how to protect and sustainably manage forests. So in addition to that, we also have a work stream on green jobs and forest education. And through this work stream, we co-organize capacity building activities with youth organizations. And ISA has been one of our biggest collaborators. And they are, all, they are also one of the observer organizations that we have at the Forest Bureau process. So I'm so excited that this webinar so far has been very successful. And um, I would like to encourage all the participants to type in their questions in the chat box or also on Slido. So the code for Slido is in the chat box. If you didn't see it, so just go back there and you will find it. And I realized that our Slido is actually very active. We already have questions, so thank you so much. And um, the first question, I will direct it to Jada because it's about social forestry and you're the one who talked uh, about this topic. So the question is, how can we make social forestry really successful? Because the person who's asking this question is uh, does not believe that social forestry can work. So maybe in just one or two minutes, just tell us like what we can do better to increase the faith of people who don't believe in it. Thanks, Juliet. This is really, this is a great question. Because uh, Miss Anonymous or Mr. Anonymous, I was like you before too. So I didn't believe in social forestry as well because number one, I come from the city. So I didn't, you know, it was a different context. And then I first visited a mangrove forest when I was 
12 years old. And I saw how beautiful the mangroves were. I saw how the fishermen interacted with the mangroves, how the farmers inland valued the brackish water that was important also for their practices. And that made an impact on me. And I studied it in college. I took the course Environmental Science. And then I went on to work with NGOs, government agencies, and other academia that actually showed me social forestry has many forms. It can be called community-based natural resource management in the Philippines. It can be called village forestry in Laos. It is called social forestry in Vietnam and all of different names because of the governance structures that are actually um, informing how people interact with their resources. So is it helpful? I believe so. Why is it helpful? If you just look around, uh, where does your food come from? Where does our water come from? These are coming from the people in the forests. I have one quick story about Nan in Thailand. It's the northernmost part and it's a border going to Laos. In the 1970s, it was highly, highly forested. But because of economic policies in Thailand, it was transformed into maize production. So right now in 2023, a lot of barren land, right? But the community people who have been living there before the 1970s and the government wanted economics as a priority said, these are our lands, these are our forests, so we will take care of it. And right now, there are statistics that actually the forests of Nan are bounding back and that private sector is actually contributing so that the forests will be regenerated and the farmers who are protecting it are compensated. So, may I invite you to come and join our field trips to Rikov? Maybe that will increase your 100% belief. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you so much. And you can actually count on me for the trip. So just tell me when we are doing it and I think <laughs> I will be there. Thank you so much. We are really running out of time, but I would, I see there are lots of questions in the Slido, in my inbox. So I would like to ask the other speakers as well. So the next question goes to Marcus. Marcus, you recommended the triad management as a potential to all these conflicts that we are witnessing. So I'm sure that uh, many IFSA students are wondering what this is about. So could you maybe in one minute or two minutes just expound and also maybe tell us the benefits? Thank you. Thanks for this question, Juliet. So, you know, there's a general um, debate whether land sharing or land sparing is a better approach. Uh, so the, the country example where land sparing is mostly applied is New Zealand. They are using, uh, like the natural forests are all under protection, more or less, and, and all the actively managed forests are outside of the natural forest area in terms of plantations, which are very intensively managed. So it's a, a land sparing for protection and then using some of the agricultural lands or some, some of the other lands for actually active plantation, very intensive forestry. Uh, on the other extreme in Central Europe, we very often have continuous cover forestry or close nature forest management, which is much less intense, uh, which includes uh, more diverse uh, mixtures of species, but the outputs are less uh, um, uh, abundant in terms of uh, timber uh, production. So you can have more diverse ecosystem services achieved by this. Uh, so that's a land, 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 land uh, sharing approach. And uh, the triad uh, management concept was trying to kind of offer another pathway to avoid this choice between land sparing and land sharing by having some protected areas according to the land uh, sparing some intensive plantation uh, management systems, but also quite a lot of area, which is then more um, uh, close nature forest management with multifunctional purposes, uh, which allows to actually have the, the different types of, of forest management objectives combined in the landscape. 
Okay, so thank you so much, Marcus, for that. I hope the students now can go back home and then on Monday, they can tell their lecturers at the university that we learned about a new concept that's called the triad management and it does this and this and this. That was so helpful. Thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, the question goes to Daniel. And the question is, who determines the carbon prices? Thank so you. you no. Know. Yes, um, so uh, carbon is being treated like a, com a global commodity. So because it's a global market, so you can you can buy your carbon credits from Europe if you live in Africa, or or in in you, you can you can buy the, the carbon credits from the other part of the world, and it's a global market. So it's being treated as a as a commodity. So the commodities they just respond to the, the demand and the supply, right? So if we have a lot of projects, we have the, 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 the price should go down. And if we have very uh, little projects or not too many, the, the, uh, the price goes, goes up. But there's a very interesting thing with the carbon price in forestry projects because uh, it's been different. The, it is being treated different in a different way from other kind of projects because they deliver what uh, in the market is understood as uh, social benefits or co-benefits. They deliver social benefits to the local communities and they 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 also impact in biodiversity um, uh, subjects or topics or indicators. Uh, they also can produce other other ecosystem services as water. Or, or uh, you know, um, so because of that, forestry projects can be more has has a, a, a higher price in the market if you compare them with the carbon uh, market of energy projects or, as I said, garbage garbage projects or everything or things like that. So nobody sets the market sets the price of it, <laughs> and 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 it can goes you know in it's a it's a very like in some cases. A negotiation with a with a company that buys the the carbon credits, they can pay as I I I don't know what's the the highest rate that is being paid by a carbon credit, but one carbon credit it it's uh, that's equivalent of a one ton of, of carbon being sequestered uh, uh, in in a forest or in a project, and one ton or one credit can be sold in Mexico uh, in about ten dollars. 10, 10 US dollars or but we have we have heard of some projects that are selling their 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 credits in twenty five dollars per 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 credit or per ton so and 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 there are some statistics that they that they think that in the future in the near future that that carbon carbon uh, cost is gonna go to one hundred dollars per per credit or per per ton so that's why there's a lot of interest of business business people of putting their money over there because it's going to be you know like very very profitable in the in the future but but nobody nobody can be sure you know of it okay yeah so thank you daniel now we are learning about demand and supply so we are on to economics we are really learning a lot today so maybe for those who are thinking of what to like businesses to establish in forestry maybe you should think about this and then when the prices hit 100 usd you can't get a lot of money food for thought yeah okay yeah so that's all the time we had for this interesting webinar i wish we could continue but i hope that our participants have been able to travel to europe thanks to marcus to, to travel to asia pacific thanks to jana and also to latin america thanks to daniel so we really really appreciate your time and uh, for doing this and i hope that we can have uh, you know like part two part three part four four of this uh, webinar series so that we can continue digging deeper into the topic and um, addressing as many issues as we can. So I will hand back the floor to my co-moderator, Matthias, if he's still around so that he can uh, wrap us up. Yes, I'm here. Thank you for your questions and thank you for the answers. Our next uh, step today is picture time. I hope Volo can help us.
Uh, yes, sure. Please, uh, everybody, open your camera. Maybe you can stop sharing for the moment, Matthias. Yes. Yes, please, everybody, open up your camera so we can make a beautiful picture. We have many participants today. Don't be shy. Okay, thank you, everybody. So please smile. Let me check. Uh, just a moment. Let's take one more picture. Please, everybody smile. Uh, yes, wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for a beautiful smile. Matthias, over to you. Yes, thank you, Volo. And uh, now, uh, our uh, the end of our session is uh, so close. So I would like to say a few things. Uh, we have uh, one episode back from the International Day of Forest Webinar Series on 1st of April. Uh, you can find the link uh, also here and also on its a social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, anywhere. Um, so, and uh, next thing is uh, only for uh, the IFSA members, I think it's, uh, it will be a special please about the presentations uh, on 5th uh 25th of march and uh, there will be a essay and photography competition so uh, show us some activity and please join and uh, uh, before the ending we want uh, your feedback so how was your conference how do you feel and uh, Mm, how can we be better and uh, what do you want to uh, ask from the presenters or anything that you want to say to us so please fill the form uh, you can find it on the QR code on the, on the screen and uh, also if you feel that you can get the certificate of your uh, participation so thank you everyone for being here uh, i was happy to see you soon see you there and uh, the participate here as a co-moderator and uh, he, i can hear uh, these wonderful presentations i can bring back home so much Thank you very much and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Now, yes, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, speaker. Bye, Dika. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, Volo. Thank you, Daniel, Dr. Marcus, Juliet. Thank you, everyone. Stay in bye. touch. Bye bye. Bye. I think we should stop the recording. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Hi, guys. It's Jana. I'm still here. Guys, yes. before I go, 